Tell us about this skirt. Wow. Well, I was given a cowboy skirt and a pair of cowboy boots, so I thought I'd better wear them to Austin. Oh. Is this your? This is your first time in Austin, yeah. or at the festival? Yeah. Have you been to Austin? Before? Never been to Austin before. I'm so happy to be here. What do you think of it? It's kind of amazing. We arrived from Scotland last night, yeah. and we went out. And uh, apparently, it's always like that on a Friday and a Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to come back. And on a Thursday, and on a Tuesday, and on a Wednesday, Great. especially during South by. Uh, well, welcome to South by Southwest. As, as Janet was saying, you know, obviously it's a special festival. I've been coming here for a dozen years, but um, such a great event in part, I think, in great part, not only because of the films that are here, but because of some of the people that are in this audience, a great audience here. So welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here. And we'll have time to take some questions. There's microphones we'll get to in a little while, but um, I just want to start the conversation off. And I'll be sure to plug the two films that you have. You're, you're here with Only Lovers Left Alive, which is playing tonight. Has anybody actually seen Only Lovers Left Alive yet? Yeah. Okay, very good. Uh, for those of you who haven't, tonight, 6.15 at the state side. If I get that incorrect, somebody correct me. Uh, and then Grand Budapest Hotel is playing on Monday night at 9 p.m. So um, Tilda sort of double feature over a couple of days here at the festival. Um, Let's talk a little bit about you and your career and your background before we talk a little bit more about the movies themselves. Um, you were born in London. Did you grow up there? Um, yeah, I always find it surprising to hear that I was born in London because I don't feel like I was, but I was. Yeah. My father was a soldier, so wherever they were passing through, you know, a child would get dropped. So I was dropped in London. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and you didn't stay there for long, it sounds like? You went uh, somewhere else? No. Um, well... We are, my family's from Scotland, yeah. and that's home. Yeah. Um, but when I was a child, we were like Germany, Germany basically. Well, not really Germany, Germany as in British army camps. Right. Um, Do you have memories of that? What are your memories of, of various places you've lived? What are some of the ones that sort of stuck with you? Or? Barbed wire. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, barbed wire and those, those uh, chicken nets. It was a different Germany, um, obviously, so. Well, inside those camps, actually, funnily enough, the first time I ever went to America was uh, inside an American army base. Mm -hmm. I saw dollars for the first time and hamburgers and, mm -hmm. you know, people who looked like they weren't really in Germany. And, uh, yeah, those camps are really interesting. They're like mm -hmm. space stations. Everybody's in an amniotic fluid of their particular uh, nationality. But uh, they don't really exist anymore in Germany. Right. Yeah. Yeah, there. So my childhood, hmm, what can I remember? I have three brothers who we, la we laughed a lot. That's my, my main memory, and that happily goes on. Uh, but a lot of traveling, a lot right. of traveling, and, uh, and uh, yeah, ask me another question. How did your, I'm curious about <laughs> childhood because I want to get to, where I want to get to in the first part of this conversation is sort of inspirations. And so uh -huh. I'm going to ask you about inspirations uh -huh. at various times in your life. Yeah. Um, leading up to some of the work you're doing now, but I think that you've, my guess is that you've been inspired by a number of people. I can guess some of those names based on certain people you've spoke passionately about, but spoken passionately about. But as a child, um, can you remember some of the first sort of figures who inspired you as a child or well, I remember as a young that, person? That's a fantastic question, Eugene, because it makes me realize I've never really thought this before. Um, I do remember my, my um, family was not a family in which people made art. It was a, mm -hmm. it was a family in which people owned art, right? So right. <laughs> it, it didn't get done, it got bought. Um, yeah, yeah. And I didn't know any artists at all. And I remember my father was, oh God, this is fantastically noisy. Chair. I know, it's a little. <laughs> uh, it's, like a, it's like a waterbed. <laughs> my waterbed skirt. Um, I remember my father was painted once. Mm -hmm. uh, he, a kind of regimental portrait, very rather sterile set up, uh -huh. and this guy was invited to, to paint him. And I was about seven, and I remember being so excited that this painter was coming to the house. It must have been something about the way in which my parents spoke about him, slightly, um, there's something slightly erotic about the fact that this painter was coming into the house. <laughs> I think my father was probably quite conflicted about the vanity aspect of being painted. So there was something a little bit caught in the way they talked about him. But I thought, wow, that's interesting. I'd not seen that in them before. So I remember this painter coming, and I just got a glimpse of him. But he was the first real painter, living mm -hmm. painter, that I ever saw. And uh, I was 
from that moment on, I was always looking for artists and mm -hmm. very, you know, my, my main memory of being a teenager was being in the art school, at, 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 at the art uh, room at, at school, yeah. and just looking for painters, looking for painters, looking for painters. Um, yeah, that was the sort of, that was the best bit of my childhood. <laughs> I think that was that was where I felt the water was kind of running clear. And and so what was the first type of creative expression, artistic expression that you embraced? I'd used to draw a lot. Um, and I took photographs the second I could get a camera, which really? was not that early. I think I was about 16, but I took uh -huh. a lot of photographs. Um, and I have to say there was something very strange but real about the fact that because my family I mean, all families are old families, but some mm -hmm. families don't move, some families do. Mm -hmm. And my family didn't move for hundreds of years and stayed in the same place. Right. And there were a lot of paintings, there are still a lot of paintings of members of my family that look really like me. I just happen to, you know, I've got the gene, and my father has the gene, but with the moustache and all that, you know. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and I just, I think it was significant for me to see images of my own face you know, this was something that informed that, that, that film I made with Sally Potter, Orlando, last yeah, week, you know. Great movie. Um, this feeling of being, your face being there, but with a ruff or with a big wig or, you know, same face, same face. <laughs> that was significant for me, I think. So I don't know whether that made me think of myself as a performer, mm. but it definitely made me think of myself in a frame. Right. Mm. Do you remember what made you think about yourself in relation to film, in relation to cinema? Do you remember early filmmakers or films, maybe? Were there those kind of moments that you still kind of hold on to that were? I, I loved film. The second I saw film, and I, uh, I think my f the first film I ever saw was Herbie Rides Again. So um, <laughs> I, I, I just, you know, I wanted to be in films, which doesn't necessarily mean I wanted to be a movie star or anything, but I just wanted to be, you know, in the back of Herbie. Uh, I wanted to be in, in the fantasy frame. Um, I never thought of myself as uh, being in films. I always wanted to be involved in making films. Yeah. So I, I used to think that I might be a writer, um, either for film or b about film. And then I started to be in plays at school mm -hmm. and um, never wanted to be an actor, but did enjoy making people laugh, um, but never took myself seriously as an actor at all. But the thing that really made me want to make films was when I met Derek Jarman when I was... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, when I left uh, university, sort of toyed with being an actor for a couple of years, but very half-heartedly, and was on the verge of realizing that I didn't want to be a performer at all, um, when I met Derek. And he said, OK, let's play. Tell the audience a little bit about who Derek Jarman is. Who here has, be honest, never seen a Derek Jarman film? Just a few people. That's Come on, you can raise your hands. But um, if, you, if you haven't, then it's also good news because you've yes. got them all to see. Exactly. So it's a win-win situation. Tell win -win. us about who Derek Jarman was and why he was so important to you. Why he still is important to you. Derek Jarman died, believe it or not, 20 years ago last month. Yep. Amazing. I can't believe it. Um, Derek Jarman is a really extraordinary artist. And now, I mean, for the last few years, whenever I've been in the situation of talking to students or people who have never heard of him um, about, you know, what is a good example of a really self-determining cinema artist who, um, yeah, has a kind of poetic voice, completely uncompromised, and yet this really extraordinary thing with Derek managed to really take a place in the culture um, beyond the Cinematheque, beyond, you know, late, late, late night, um, screenings on television channels that people don't watch normally. Uh, and he, he's it. Uh, he was an English artist um, who, I mean, he would say, I know, and this is one of the things that was such an amazing education about being around Derek, he would say he was the carrier of the flame for his generation that he'd inherited from previous generation all the way back to William Blake. I mean, seriously, you know, that outsider artist working in, in an interdisciplinary way. He was a writer, he was a poet, he was a painter, first and foremost. Um, he grew up through the 70s, working in a collective way, 
Um, and I met him in 1985 in a pretty orthodox way. He was um, casting Caravaggio. And he was already established as an experimental filmmaker. Um, he'd made, he made, his first feature was a film called Sebastiani, which is a, a beautiful gay love story in Latin. Naturally. <laughs> yes, in Latin. Um, and uh, about St. Sebastian. And uh, he made a, 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 an extraordinary adaptation of Shakespeare's The Tempest with Toya Wilcox playing um, Miranda and Heathcote Williams, who's a great poet, playing um, um, Prospero. And um, he wanted to make this film about Caravaggio, and he was developing it for years. And we had mutual friends who said, you, might, you, would, you people would really like each other. But finally, um, I went along in a really kind of banal way, just at the point when I was saying to my agent, you know what, this acting thing is not for me. I don't want to be a theatre actor. I don't want to be an industrial actor. I'm just going to you know, head out. She said, well, go and see Derek Jarman. He wants to meet you for this film. And that was it. You know, he, he, uh, it, we just became friends instantly. And uh, I made Caravaggio with him. And then I made seven films with him. And he died in 1994. <laughs> Uh, of AIDS, and he was latterly, when he um, became HIV positive in 1989, he became extraordinarily uh, engaged as a political activist and um, made work. I mean, we made a film called Edward II, which was an adaptation of the Christopher Marlowe play, uh, which was very sort of, you know, obviously, um, you know, updated and, and, and politically engaged. We involved, at that time in 1992, 1991, someone help me, 1991, 1992, there were these uh, very frightening um, laws being brought in by the Thatcher government uh, restricting yeah. the culture of, 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 uh, of gay life and uh, very similar uh, laws to those being brought in, being brought in in Russia recently. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a very, very nasty taste to feel these things continuing after all that time. But we made a film um, in collaboration with a group called Outrage, who were protesting this, uh, this law, Clause 28. Yeah, I mean, he was beyond, 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 beyond. And the thing that's amazing about Derek was, as I say, that his films, and he, there was a point at which he started to experiment with the form. So we were making Super 8 films, which we blew up to 35. And we made, uh, we made a short like that once, and then that worked so well that we made a, uh, a feature called The Last of England, um, non-narrative feature film, like 93 minutes, um, with a soundtrack, extraordinary soundtrack by Simon Fisher-Turner, who was Derek's constant collaborator. That film was shown in the Prince Charles Cinema off Leicester Square in London <laughs> and had huge you know, mainstream reviews. I mean, it was panned, but that doesn't matter. The, <laughs> the, 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 you know, it says a lot about the culture that, that he was taken that seriously. You know, he was a very important cultural activist, was constantly on the television. People knew about him. You know, he wasn't um, sidelined. And I, I just think it's worth mentioning that because mm -hmm. we're 20 years on, we're fighting for space that we actually had once. So I just, you know, it's worth mentioning as a sort of history lesson that that's what he really weighed. Yeah. It's an amazing um, impact that he's had. And, yeah. and, and we see it in your work, and, and you bring it up as an important touch point or moment for you. Um, in addition to talking about inspirations, I want to talk about sort of challenges or struggles or overcoming those. You mentioned a moment ago um, sort of being at a moment before I guess either meeting or working with Derek, where you were sort of, you weren't sure if you wanted to continue down the same path. I never, you know, I, being a performer, I feel so embarrassed about it because you, we, we're constantly seeing actors saying that they always wanted to be actors and that it, that it has this reputation of being a thing that people long to do and they ha have great ambition and they go through fire to become actors. And I, I feel, uh, you know, embarrassed because I never did. I still don't. Every <laughs> film I make is the last time I'm going to perform. Uh, <laughs> truly, truly, truly. And, and I also admit that I keep doing it. So, you know, it can be both. Um, but so I'm aware that I'm an odd one. 
But then, this, then to, to look at how it's possible for me to continue also is back to Derek, because what Derek did, not just for me yeah. as a performer, but also for Simon, who was, um, who was his musician, uh, composer, uh -huh. and Sandy Powell, who has gone on wow. to yeah. be the great costume designer who works regularly with Scorsese. Um, we, that, Caravaggio was our first film. We were all just out of art school, just out of university. And Derek said, look, here's a big toy box. Play with it. Find out what way you want to be a costume designer, what way you want to be a composer, what way you want to be a performer. Let's just play. And that's the reason I can go on mm. doing what I'm strangely now in my something like 30th year of doing because of that start, because mm. he put the tools in our hands. And um, by the time he died nine years in, I was kind of up a gum tree because I'd still only almost worked with one filmmaker. I'd also worked with Sally Potter and also with Peter Wallen on one film, Friendship's Death. But I still wasn't a professional. Mm -hmm. And I still didn't know how to work in an industry. Mm. The great miracle for me is that then people started coming out the woodwork and saying, we get it, come and play with us. And so now, I'm happy to say that I, I wasn't high and dry, you know, that he, he wasn't the only one who wanted to work in that way. What are, what is a challenge or are the challenges you face today in order to maintain that sort of spirit or approach or to hold on to some of those lessons that Derek or others in that period of your life taught you? Or is it easy? It's, it's not... Do you know, in a really strange way, it's easier now. And it's easier because, as with Only Lovers, for example. Yes. Um, Only Lovers... Jim first rang me up on a New Year's Eve. I think it's eight years ago. He says it's less, but I think it's eight or nine years ago. And, you know, it was that long ago that he rang me up and said, hey, man, let's make a film about vampires. <laughs> and, um, and, it, and it took that long and the, the, the thing is that now I know because I'm so long in the tooth I know that it takes that long right. I mean I am love which I made with my friend Luca Guadagnino took us 11 years um, you know whatever Julia took us five years um, uh, we need to talk about Kevin took us five years I just I'm so beaten into submission you know? <laughs> I know it takes that long so in a way it's become easier so the, those right. the challenges um, those awful moments. I mean, that's one of the things that I've been able to uh, provide, I think, when I've worked with first-time filmmakers, because mm -hmm. it, it's really scary when it's your first film and you're, you've gone into turnaround again. Mm -hmm. But if there's someone there who says, listen, keep breathing, it's okay, this is just part of the course, we will survive, um, yeah, I think it helps. So I think in many ways it's easier. I don't know. I'll have to think of another challenge. Um, yeah, I mean, there's always the bank manager, but... Let's talk about... <laughs> there's always that. Mm. Let's talk about Only Lovers Left Alive, mm. and it is an absolutely terrific film. We were thrilled um, to have the film at the New York Film Festival back in New York, and it played in Cannes last year. Um, you get a call from Jim. Yeah. Let's make a vampire movie. Yeah. Um, Tell me a little bit, tell us a little bit more about what intrigued you about this character and working with Jim uh, and kind of working in this, uh, in the world that he was hoping to create. Well, I first met Jim, um, amusingly, um, backstage at a darkness concert. Really? <laughs> in, uh, in LA. We, we just both happened to be there. And then a, about a week later, he wrote to me and, I, sent me Broken Flowers and asked me to be in Broken yeah, Flowers. Yeah. Um, and so that, I think in that film, I wasn't part of the development of that yeah. film. That was already going to happen, mm -hmm. and he asked me to be in it. And then we sort of worked a bit over the years towards him making Limits of Control. And at the same time, we were talking about this. Um, so I, I say that to explain that working with Jim, in, certain, in terms of my experience, is just a long, long chewing of the cud. It's like... You know, you just chew it out. Over but those happen more quickly, and this one obviously took. Well. Or it, it, were they all for Jim, for you, and for Jim, I should say, in your. This took. A, this took, uh, I think, longer. I mean, as I understand it, Jim used to work 
to a sort of routine. Yeah. Um, I mean, not a routine, but he had more structure. More you structure. You know, yeah. he would shoot a film every two years, more or less. And there was a point at which that that rhythm was broken slightly. And um, there was a moment when it felt that you know the Only Lovers was snagging on the years. It was a little longer than it ever had been before. Um, but you know, things were happening. We were putting the band together, and the band changed a little bit, right, and, right. And, and finally it happened. But, but to answer your question, what were the things that intrigued me, apart from chewing with Jim? He, uh, he, he put me in touch with this book, which I think was a very early seed for him, uh, which Sarah Driver, his sweetheart, had given him, which is Mark Twain's Diaries of Adam and Eve, which is just heavenly. If anybody doesn't know it, I really um, suggest you pick it up. It's so beautiful. It's a very sort of, you know, winsome sounds like I'm being pejorative now. Nah, it's beautiful, very playful. Um, diary of, first of all, Adam, who's this incredibly curmudgeonly, you know, Wednesday, I've got all these animals to name, and it's so boring. I mean, you know, and, it's, and then he sort of notices this will-o'-the-wisp creature. He doesn't really know what she is and what it is, and she's sort of hopping about going, oh, the stars are so beautiful, I want to put them in my hair. And, and, and so these characters, the seeds of the characters in the film, is in this book. Oh. Um, so we just started to sort of spin the silk around those characters, around this premise, which is that you don't have to be like somebody uh. to love them, uh. and to love them forever, and to love them really properly. You know, you don't have to become like them. You don't have to stop them being like themselves. You can sit in wonder and go, man, you're weird, but I still really dig you. You know, you can do that. Um, and, and that's the premise, I think, that we wanted to build, build into the heart of this. because. Of course, it's a vampire film, but it's much more a love story, I think. It's, it's, and it is about human beings as well. I feel like, as I, I don't know Jim Jarmusch personally. I know his work. I don't know Sarah Driver personally. I know her work. I feel like when I watch this movie, I'm getting this really fun window into their lives of, as creative people and who have this relationship together. Mm. Did you look to them and their relationship in it, any way? It's a documentary, let's face it. Uh, <laughs> I wonder that, but... Yeah. It is, I mean, it's a documentary about so many people that I know, I have right. to say, and, and, yeah. and Jim and Sarah are, are, you know, right up there. Yeah, it's, um, it's really, it's, I mean, going back to when Jim first said to me, hey man, let's make a vampire film, I almost felt like saying, but haven't you been making vampire films all along? Right. It feels <laughs> so obvious. We, you know, the Jim Jarmusch vampire film, don't we feel like we saw it, what? Wasn't Mystery Train a vampire <laughs> film? You, uh, it feels so natural, so, uh -huh. but at the same time, for it to be really a love story, mm -hmm. and to have at its heart a female presence who is so um, enlightening, yeah. And literally, enlightening brings light. Yeah. And so positive, I think, is a real kind of step. Switching gears slightly, you are a passionate advocate for cinema. Mm -hmm. Cinema as you know this major concept that drives so many of us. Um, and yet, I think that our relationship to the cinema and what cinema is, how we define it, is is challenged, it's changing, mm -hmm. um, it's under fire. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to hear you sort of share with us sort of your view on cinema today and how we sort of hold on to it, mm -hmm. but how we sort of also let it evolve and mature and grow and change in front of us and what you're thinking about in that regard. I have a, a kind of, my guides in this inquiry, um, are my children, right. who are now 16, um, they're twins. And um, they, when I started to see, I mean, they're like lab rats, really. <laughs> 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 my poor kids. Um, they're very grateful, though. Um, they get it. Um, they, uh, when I first started sort of thinking about cinema for them, I, I started to really uh, examine my own desires about cinema 
for myself. And also, I started to become really interested in being a programmer. Yeah. And we started making some film events, which I'll tell you about maybe in a second. But, but it was really to do with the children and seeing them, seeing their, their eyes opening. And I started to think about what cinema what it is, you know, why is it good for the soul, and what, what it asks of us, and what it gives us. And, and in a nutshell, what it is for me is this amazingly humane opportunity to put yourself in the shoes of somebody else. Right. It's no more complicated, and it's no less powerful than that. You go in, all goes dark, and you put yourself into somebody else's shoes and see through their eyes. And that means the filmmaker, although it can also mean the people who are being, if it's a humanist, you know, if there are humans on the screen. But mainly it's you put yourself, as a filmmaker says, come with me and see what I'm seeing, and I'm going to show you something that, that you may not have thought of before. And that's just mega. That's so powerful. Even a painter um, um, who can do it, you know, can do less because a painter only at one, uh, you know, at one time is showing you one frame. But, mm -hmm. a, but a filmmaker can take you into an experience and an existential uh, atmosphere that may be a trip for you. It's a transport. You know, it's like a magic carpet. So anyway, like this is how I feel about cinema. I'm sorry. It's uh, like really highfalutin. But it also, by the way, involves Herbie Rides Again. It, <laughs> it is the same thing, you know. And I. And I think a lot about when, the I think the first film that I ever saw, um, Herbie Rides Again, I think I was about seven or eight. And, the, and I, there was this very seminal moment for me when my son, um, I, I was asked to, uh, to deliver a thing at the San Francisco Film Festival, the, the State of Cinema Address. Yes. And I was... I'm so lazy, and I really, I mean, it felt like a big piece of homework that I was <laughs> not into. And I was on the verge of constructing this response, saying, thank you so much for the honor, but I really can't do it. And I'd read this re request as state of cinema. It sounded a bit like I was being asked to, they needed somebody who would write something about the industry or, you know, fiscal reports or something. And I, <laughs> I'd thought, no, I, I, so I'm not for that. And I was just about to reply to this, to this letter, and I went up to say goodnight to my children, and they were um, eight and a half at this moment. And, um, and my son, who's a very fanciful being, mm -hmm. said to me, I was, I was giving him a dream, I guess sort of going like this and saying, you know, here's a dream, and I don't know what I was talking about, some sort of unicorn or something. And he suddenly <laughs> said to me, Mama, what were people's dreams like before cinema was invented? <laughs> and I, I, it was unbelievable. And I went downstairs and I wrote this reply and I said, um, hold your horses. And I, and I wrote this thing. And this really, his remark totally blew my mind. And it made me think about what it would have been like to have been born before cinema, what your consciousness was, might have been like before, before cinema. And, how lucky we are and how we must use it and nurture it. Anyway, I don't know whether that's really what you were asking me, but that's, <laughs> that, that's sort of how I feel about it. And, I, and, I, and I'm just constantly looking for, for ways of retaining mm -hmm. that experience for people. And we're in this place, this festival is this incredible intersection of film and interactive and television this year. I wonder how, as a follow-up to that, your own relationship to cinema now is changing, or has changed, as we experience, or we can experience movies, we can experience cinema you know, on a device like this yeah. in so many different ways, and in ways that people like those in this room and those in the hall are trying to kind of reimagine and re reinvent. Yeah. How has your own personal relationship with cinema changed, even, even recently? I'm just open to all of it. I think, um, you know, the thing, the drug itself is strong enough and powerful enough to withstand all of this. And we just, we're still going to want to go and 
sit in dark rooms and look at flickery old prints. And we're going to want to watch things here. And sooner or later, we'll have a chip in our wrist and we can watch it there. It's all, it's all fine. I, I, I'm up for all of it. I think that essential existential kind of transport is never, we're never going to not want that. And I think it, it, it's still a sort of, uh, it, as long as, no, I, I don't see why we would ever stop wanting that. We just have to, you know, separate the signal from the noise, right. as they say. Right. You know, we just have to keep our, keep our eyes clear. <laughs> um, it's very interesting because I think one of the challenges to cinema is not only how people view or experience, mm -hmm. I should say, cinema, but also how they find it. And mm -hmm. so I, this, uh, this I do want to bring back to your role as a, as a programmer, as a curator. Cur the, the curation of cinema, the creation of everything around us, of content in our lives, is so vital. There's so much coming at us. We sometimes need guides. We sometimes need curators to help us figure out what to see or why to see it or to challenge us to see things. You've mm -hmm. challenged, us, challenged us already today um, to, to, uh, to embrace and, and immerse ourselves in the work of, uh, for one person, just Derek Jarman. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about your role as a, as a curator, as an organizer. You dragged a movie screen across, um, across Scotland, I believe, and uh, that sounded amazing. But tell us about your work in that regard. Well, I mean, it is true that, you know, we are living, on one hand, we're living in an era of great riches. You know, we have all these possibilities. Um, and we also have over a hundred years worth of cinema now to download and draw on and program and all the rest of it, <laughs> and preserve, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, but we also, there are obstacles to the dissemination of all of this mm -hmm. good stuff. Mm -hmm. And I happen to live in, um, a, a, in the north of Scotland in a kind of big village, on the outskirts of a big village. I can't really call it a town because I think this is a town, well, <laughs> no, my village is kind of the size of this room. And, um, but it is a small town in the north of Scotland where the old ladies will constantly come up and tell you that there used to be two cinemas in that town. Right. And until relatively recently, I mean, until the 60s. And now, of course, they're, they're gone. And there is a cinema a half an hour away, which is a big multiplex where you can see Harry Potter pretty much around the clock. And <laughs> you can't see that much else. And so one summer, it's now quite a long time ago, yeah. um, in 2008, I uh, rented uh, an old bingo hall because um, I just got so sick of not being able to see things and, and, and my children not being able to go and see things. And so we thought we would we would run it as a festival. Uh, I wanted actually to run it as a cinema full time, but there were all sorts of boring uh, legal reasons why we couldn't. But we had a film festival, which we programmed within about four minutes on the back of a napkin. You know, <laughs> my children, Sandro, my sweetheart, and my friend Mark Cousins, um, oh. who's a film historian and filmmaker. Yeah. We made this program, and we had this film festival. And it became a kind of sensation, not only because all sorts of um, friends came from uh, New York and Paris and London, but the l local people just ate it up. And we were showing Parajanov, we were showing Fassbinder, we were showing um, uh, Kenneth Anger turned up, by the way, one night, just out of the blue. It was <laughs> insane. And people really went hard for it. We were showing, we showed the Bill Douglas trilogy, which is a great Scottish classic, very underseen. Um, and um, it was just full. You know, we had to put on extra screenings. And these are, this is a small town with a lot of old ladies and fishermen and unmarried mothers. And they just loved it, loved it, loved it, loved it. And what was really fabulous was it, um, when the old ladies started coming in through the door, they started to say, oh, this is the old ballerina ballroom. This is where I met my husband when we were 16. Oh. And we realized that it used to be uh, a venue in fact, they, and then we found these old, these old uh, bills upstairs, and the Pink Floyd had played there in like, <laughs> 1971. Really amazing. And the Beatles were on their way there when Love Me Do went into the charts, and they had to go back down to London. They were on a Scottish tour. Anyway, it's kind of one of those hotching little places that the, you, know, you just have to sort of rub off the dust, and there it all is. Because you know, people had stopped looking for this place. They'd just gone to the View Cinema. Anyway, this became uh, an amazing event. And 
not just because of the films, but also because we did things like we said you could get in for free if you brought home baking with you. So we had the best cafe in Christendom. And you also got in for free if you dressed according to the film. So if you came to see the Scottish film in a kilt, you got in for free. And if you came to the Polanski fearless vampire killers made up as a vampire, you got in for free. And it was fantastic. It was great. So the following year, we um, wanted to make another event, and we couldn't use the ballerina because we lost it. So we rented a mobile cinema, and we pulled it across Scotland. Um, well, for an hour a day, we pulled the whole thing. It's 43 tons. And again, it became this community enterprise. It wasn't just about films. It was about the experience of making this festival, which is why what we know, I can tell already, I've only been here for 12 hours, but this place has got it happening. It really has. We yeah. went out, we came, back from, came from Scotland last night, we went out on 6th Street. This is a festival. This is not just a place where the industry screens next year's you know, pot boilers. This is a festival, you can feel it. And so we made a festival there, and we've made a number of other festivals. We've made one in Beijing. And mm -hmm. I love it. I love it because people just check out. They go, I don't care what you're going to show me. Let's have a dance and watch a film. Yeah. And that's what a festival is really for. Nobody goes to a festival and goes, hmm, I'm not sure I really want to see this because I'm hmm, not sure that's worth the $8. They go, I don't know, let's watch it. Look, if, if, um if the slogan, let's have a dance and watch a film, were to, to, to be the slogan of every festival, I think we'd all, you know, that would be just enough. Well, that's a really important thing we do in our film festivals. We yeah. always dance before the screenings. Always, always. It's really important. You know, you put on personal Jesus and you rock out. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I have all to, the, yeah, really. In pajamas. You've named my favorite song, so we're, we're in sync. Um, I will ask just one last question, and so if you have a question in the audience, please uh, stand in line at one of the microphones, and we'll get to as many as we can. You mentioned the industry, and I don't want to go down the path of talking about the business, but because there are a number of filmmakers here who are perhaps just getting their career started or making their way and trying to figure out how to relate to the industry, I want to ask you one question about the industry, and that is, um, you are at a point now in your life, your career, where your involvement in a project can, of course, bring a tremendous amount of attention, whether it's a festival where you're dragging the 43-ton screen or whether it's um, a movie by a first-time filmmaker. Um, how do you now, how have you learned to manage and navigate your own relationship to the industry? Because the industry would want you to go in certain directions that clearly you've chosen maybe not to go, or you, you, or you have to sort of figure out how to sort of mod moderate or modulate that that relationship, and, and what are some of the things you learned to sort of stay true to yourself, but also make the most of the opportunities that are available to you from an industry? I learned, and this is kind of heavy to say this, but I learned that the mountain does come to Muhammad. <laughs> you know, if you do your thing, and you're doing it for all the right reasons, and you're really bringing yourself with you, you're not leaving yourself outside, and you're choosing collaborators who want you, they don't want you to leave yourself outside, they really want you and everything you can bring with you, um, it comes around. Right. You know, it comes around. And, and, and I learned that partly, as I said earlier, from Derek Jarman, right. who just became central, but not by chasing the center, right. by whipping the center around him, and huh. that's just how it works. So yeah. this is going to sound so trite because everybody says this, but you just have to plant your feet in your own ground and, and be your own center. You know, bend your knees for sure because there are going to be some winds coming, but, right. but, but make sure you're in your own ground. Don't, I mean, I don't know. I, what am I talking about? I don't know about the industry, and I, and I don't know how to make those compromises. You know, there are people who will say, with very good reason, and, you know, there's a battle here to be lost for this reason, and, you right. know, go and do this, because then you'll get the chance to do that. I've never done that, so I don't know how to play that game, and I'm sure that it works for lots of people, but I'm just saying that if you don't feel you can do that, just keep breathing, just plant your feet, do it your way, and 
it might mean you have to have really creative conversations with your bank manager. Um, <laughs> it, it probably will because it's not, you know, it, it's, it's not a get rich quick thing, but um, just the culture's being built by us. It doesn't belong to anybody else, and we, you know, need to make deals with it. It's ours. So we make it, right? And you just do your thing, and you will put another flake of skin on that body, and it will become U-shaped. I don't know. The culture is being built by us, Tilda Swinton. Let's take some questions from the audience. I've really enjoyed the opportunity to ask you a few questions, and now I want to give those here a chance. Well, can we go here okay. first and Hello. Then switch sides? <laughs> it took me like 40 minutes watching Snowpiercer before I recognized you. Oh. That's a, you're such a good That's actress. That's a huge compliment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <But> <laughs> Those who have not seen Snowpiercer, you won't get that, but yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, um, you've worked with a lot of the greats and when they were starting out and when they were more um, established, like Fincher and Wes Anderson and the Coens and, and Bong Joon-ho and, and Lynn Ramsey. Can you talk about uh, the challenges, your favorite things, and most importantly, what you learned from a lot of ex uh, experiences with them? Well, the first thing I'd say is that um, for me personally, but I am happy to say I'm not the only one, um, it's the conversation that uh, m most of my collaborators and I, well, all of them, um, have really got off on that, that thing of whipping something up with someone, amusing each other, um, daring each other, <laughs> and uh, that's the most important thing. And then the film is almost always I hope this doesn't sound sacrilegious, but kind of secondary to that. That's the most important thing. The, and testament to that is that the relationships go on. And that's one of the great pleasures of my life is working with people again and again and again. So the conversation just rolls on, rolls on. And then, oh, we made that film that came out of that conversation. But the conversation itself rolls on and was the most enticing bit. Um, and yes, as I say, I. That's, that's not a rare thing. I think, well, all the filmmakers you mentioned that I've been fortunate enough to have conversations with, and, and they are my friends, um, build their work on that. And, and, and it's not to be sneezed at. Because apart from anything else, that's what gets you through everything. That's what gets you through being told your film's gone into turnaround. That's what gets you through when an actor turn, uh, you know, falls out of a project. That's what gets you through when you're on a two-year publicity tour and you're waking up in the best Western somewhere and you meet the, you know, your colleague at the breakfast table and you go, yeah, you're my pal, I really like you, I want to have breakfast with you, let's go and talk to the press about this film. That's what gets you through. And if you don't have that, I, I've never had to work without that. I don't know how people do it. So I think it's worth investing in friendship when you work. Thank you. Let me switch to this side. Hi. You're known for playing so well, very strange characters. You even made the social worker in Moonrise Kingdom seem rather quirky and mysterious. Of all these roles, which to you see, has seemed the strangest? The strangest? <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, off the top of my head, playing a corporate lawyer <laughs> right. <laughs> Truly, that took, that takes the cake. Have uh, ha did that inspire you in some way, or have special meaning, or uh, was more important than the others? Well, the thing the thing that was very interesting for me about that film, um, which was Michael Clayton by the great Tony Gilroy such an incredible uh, film to be a part of. Because for me, it, it occupied a kind of territory. So it was sort of used a sort of grain, which I'm not used to. So very naturalistic, mm -hmm. very apparently realistic, a <laughs> world that exists. Well, so they, who knew? But anyway, apparently it does. And um, I, so for me to go into that, it was like deep cover, you know? Ah. And um, that was really fascinating. Um, and the script 
worked with that grain as well and was incredibly precise. Uh, so yes, that was, I've, I've very rarely worked with that. I was like a real proper actor on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi. So I think corporate lawyer is the perfect segue. Um, you've spoken about your film, I Am Love, as, among other things, a critique or commentary on capitalism as a fairy story. And I'm curious about how the capacity for cinema to function as social critique, uh, social practice, informs your work, both how you approach what you make and how you make it. Well, you know, I have to admit, um, I, I, I've, I've said, you know, I'm aware that I'm not educated, whoops, not educated as a, as a performer, but I, I, I did read social and political science at university, and I've never, you know, people have sometimes said, that's a strange leap, and I have never thought that it was a strange leap at all to be a political science major and, and, and make cinema. It's always felt like film is, um, yeah, it's a, just as I've spoken about it being an existential act, it's a, it's a, it's a politi it, it carries with it the, the possibility of, of being politically very powerful. So, um, yeah, you, you, you try and, <coughs> one of the things that I do like, if, there, if there's something, if, if there's a point at which I'm prepared to talk, take myself seriously as a performer, it's the point at which I notice that I really, have interest in acting out stories of people who are on a kind of precipice in their life. They, they make some kind of transformation, whether it's the transformation between being a boy to a woman or between being a loyal and dumbed um, wife and mother of a very rich man to being the lover and refugee of a great house, or um, being a dyed-in-the-wool, um, carefree alcoholic, uh, to being someone who really cares about somebody else, a small child. Whatever it is, I've always loved, whenever I've talked to a filmmaker about a story, because it's usually that rather than reading a script, because I'm, I'm normally in, uh, talking around a kitchen table about a story, the, the point at which my, the performer in me gets interested is the point at which they say, and then, there's this precipice, then there's this moment when they, this person, this, this, this person, and I don't use the word character because I'm slightly sort of suspicious of the word character, but the person falters, that their trajectory, they go, yeah, I'm this person, I'm this persona, switches, and they have to choose another way of being in the world. I really love that, and I think that's political. I think that that in itself, to, to just make that gesture in the world, to just put out these stories that it is possible to change, that it is sometimes not only possible, but it, let's face it, it is in, inevitable that we change. And one of the things that, that moves me about society is the way in which it's constantly um, suggesting that we decide what we are, who we are, how we're going to dress, you know, who we're going to marry, what jobs we're going to have, and that's going to be it. Se signed and sealed deal, and we're never going to change. And it just seems to be such a bad idea because it doesn't work. And we all know that the day comes when people go, ooh, that bit's just fallen off. That doesn't work anymore. And that bit's fallen <laughs> off. And people's shells come off and they start to emerge. You know, that feels to me like life. So to sh keep putting that out there with, through these different stories feels to me like something political. And I'm really honored to, to do that. Thank you. You, um, you, en you engaged with the art world in a unique way recently. You were celebrated by the Museum of Modern Art in the fall, um, but earlier in the year, a group of us from Lincoln Center took a walk down uh, one afternoon to watch you at rest in a gallery at MoMA. Um, and I was wondering, I, wanted to, I didn't want to let the moment pass without asking you about it, because I wonder what you take from that now. Some time has passed. The notion of being um, completely alone, yet in a very public environment. Uh, and, and what are some maybe memories or, or, or recollections or experiences you sort of take from that, from that moment? Um, that, that's a piece called The Maybe, which I, I made originally um, now 19 years ago in London. And um, MoMA had asked me to recreate it because they, they've been recreating performance art pieces for a while now. Um, 
and it was, it was like a bloody living history lesson that when I'd originally made it, not only was there no Twitter, there were no mobile telephones. <laughs> and um, it is an interesting fact of our life, apparently, that it's possible for millions and millions and millions of people to see something without actually being there. But I find that a very interesting um, kind of aspect to that work, that because um, the piece is about authentic presence and about the fact that there actually only is one body in one case, in one place, at any one time. And yet, it feels as if things, there, there are sort of, there's an addition now. now. Now that we live in the world we live in, there's, a, there's another whole cavalcade of possibilities around a piece of work. I mean, apparently I'm there now. <laughs> And that's real, that's a reality. Apparently I'm there all the time. I mean, the very fact that somebody might write that means that it is real, maybe, because don't we believe everything we read? It's very, very interesting. So, I don't know, that's a piece that exists. It, I never talk about it beyond you know, what I've just said. I don't talk about the experience of it, yeah. because apart from anything else, you may be wanting to know what it's like is part of the piece. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I intend to go on doing it. Um, and who knows, maybe I will and maybe I won't, but presumably someone will write that I'm doing it every day till I die. <laughs> That's part of it. The notion of being um, somewhere and, and, and engaging in that moment is a really profound one. And we're at this festival where, um, again, the interactive side is interacting, is, is colliding so, so dramatically with uh, the, the tr more traditional film side, and, and we're all kind of processing how to mm. how to deal with these kinds of devices and how they interact on our the how other, they affect our personal but lives. But the other right thing to say about that is that you know you put somebody, anybody actually, I would suggest, although it's an argument because there are some people in a box that mean certain things, and then there are there are other people that mean certain different things. But you put someone in a box in MoMA, and just through two brick walls, there's somebody else lying in a doorway mm -hmm. and nobody's looking at them, mm -hmm. they're walking over them, you know, 15 times a day. Mm -hmm. It's just, yep. it, you know, it, it's just a, 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 a kind of exercise in awareness. Yeah. Yeah. And I would hope that anyone walking out of MoMA might notice someone else lying down for a millisecond longer than they did before they went in. Very good. Okay, which side was I on? I'm sorry. Was I, I on this side, this side and then this side? I think you're up to me. Here and then here. Hi. One of my favorite films that I've ever seen at South by Southwest was Conceiving Ada. I love that movie. It stayed with me to this date. And I'm wondering what the conversation was that led you to do that. That's the great Lynn Hirschman, yes. um, who so I heard from this morning, actually, who um, I've worked with several times. She's just awesome. She's... she's um, She's, she's out there, <laughs> Lynn. I mean, she's out there in terms of interactivity in a way that's yeah. like ahead of all of us. She is. Um, like in Conceiving Ada. Yeah, totally. And then and we made Techno a film Lust. after that called Techno Lust, yeah. which is amazing about a, a um, computer programmer genius called Rosetta Stone who cyber clones yeah. herself three times into the pixels, Ruby, Marine, and, uh, and Olive. Uh, it's wild. She's completely wild. Do, you, do yourself a favor and, and seriously, Lynn Hirschman, Lisa, look up her work and, and you, will, you will be um, challenged and engaged in amazing ways. Yeah. Can, we, can we sneak in a couple just quick more? But sorry, I didn't sorry. answer your question, the conversation. Lynn is uh, constantly, um, you know, chewing this whole cud about, um, about the the, the interrelationship of, uh, of technology and human consciousness. Um, she's now working on something that I'm talking to her about, just about aging, just about the concept of not aging ever and what that, practically speaking, and, and, and uh, uh, biologically what that actually means. But she's, she's really on the edge of, of that thinking. She's great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was just wondering, what do you love about movies? Where are we? Oh, hello. Hi. What do I love about movies? 
I, I love, I'm quite an idle person, and I love being taken, you know, like going into somewhere, traveling, actually. I mean, it, it's quite banal, but when I first um, made Caravaggio, which was the first film I made, we went to the Berlin Film Festival, and I'd never been to a film festival before, and that was my prototypical, like, eureka moment with film festivals, because I saw the world suddenly. I mean, I already saw more international s cinema in that one trip of a week than I'd seen before, I think, although I was fortunate enough to be at the University of Cambridge, and there was a really great Cinematheque, which I think doesn't exist anymore, <gasps> at Cambridge, and we saw a fair, fair bit of, of, of international cinema there. But that feeling of transport, that feeling of travel, and then I started making films with filmmakers. I mean, Klaus Viborny, who's a really interesting experimental filmmaker, said at that film festival, will you come and make a film in Fiji? You know, <laughs> just that. It, it, it is very, it's quite prosaic of me, but just that thing of being able to travel. You know, sometimes I'll say, where do I want to go today? I want to go to Japan. Oh, let's get some ozu, you know. Just that feeling of, or I want to go to 1954, or I want to go to the future, or wherever. That, that, that thing of, 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 of being taken somewhere, I really, really value, rely on it. It's, a great it's been a great opportunity to have Tilda here on this, just the second day of South by Southwest. You have an entire festival, the entire next week, available to you to um, follow, in, uh, follow in the kind of um, ideas and mentality that you've just presented to us, not only as we talk about building culture, but as we imagine traveling the world through the many films that will be available to all of us over this next week. So uh, thank you for reminding us of that and talking with us about that today, Tilda.